back to Asteroid Day. We've only got about an hour left. It's gone so fast and we met such amazing people. Here with me now, I have Jens Kaisel from the University of Luxembourg. And as we heard earlier today, the University of Luxembourg has established a very exciting master's project. Yeah, it's really one of the most exciting things we're doing right in the moment. We have been establishing the interdisciplinary master in space. Um, we built this on, on our expertise in space technology and also on the dynamism in Luxembourg. So this master will start only this September and we had a massive amount of, of applications. So it's really a great adventure for us. And thinking about Luxembourg and what Luxembourg has been involved with over recent years in space resources, for instance, and also we've had SES established here for a long time. I believe you've been working with the companies and even the government to think about the course. Yeah, that's right. So we've got a long-standing collaboration with SES for 10 years. We're doing great research together. And we've got a very good collaboration with the Luxembourg Space Agency, but also with many other companies. And we've been sitting together to set up this master and it really runs from the technology side to the business side all the way along. So what would somebody want to get out of this? If somebody was looking to do this course at the University of Luxembourg, what could they think about doing at the end point? So to start with, I think it's really to get digital or space literate people out of it. They will learn about uh, rocket science, they will learn about computer science, about space communication, but also about space resources, what can be done, how they could create a business perhaps out of this, why not in Luxembourg? That's what they could do. And what language will it be in? So it will be in, in English, So, but Luxembourg is a very international place, so by living here they will learn also other languages and they will learn by the end of the master for going into a big industry. So they can go either to SES or to smaller exciting companies like iSpace for really for learning something about space and being more attractive really for the market. Thank you so much for your time. We wish you the pleasure. very best of luck with this really exciting new course for the University of Luxembourg, which itself is a, still a relatively new uh, university, but becoming very established at a rapid rate. So wonderful successes ahead, I'm sure. And with that, Rusty, it's over to you. Thanks very much. Um, we're now pleased to present here a panel on uh, emerging and current science uh, in asteroids of all different uh, types. And I want to add to that a, a bit of a communication uh, challenge as well that I think uh, I'd like to hear and I think the audience would love to hear something about um, uh, in looking to communicate this through the media uh, to the public. But I want to start with, uh, with Rob here, uh, University of Hawaii. What are, what are you guys doing with pan stars and other things at the moment? I joined the PanStars project about 16 years ago, uh, before when it was truly just an idea. And uh, when I went there, I wanted to manage the development of what we call the moving object processing system. And uh, I had three goals, three things I wanted to do that I thought were really exciting at the time. I wanted to find asteroids that were in orbit around the Earth, and only uh, one had been known by at that time. I wanted to find asteroids in the main belt that were collisionally disrupting each other, actually destroying each other, colliding and then disrupting. And I want to find an interstellar object. And I remember going to lectures. Or 16 go, years ago, you wanted to find. Years, you can go look on the on, look online. It's there. Great. And uh, <laughs> I would go to I would go to conferences and present this to my colleagues, and most of them would roll their eyes and uh, not believe that it was going to be possible. I know, I know that eye rolling bit. <laughs> and uh, and uh, because at that time, actually, the probability that pan stars would find an interstellar object was about two percent, a one in fifty chance that we would actually find one of these objects. So I was uh, very happy when just uh, a little less than two years ago, PanStars actually found an interstellar object. This is an asteroid or maybe a comet that's actually coming from a different solar system and it's passing through our solar system. It's not gravitationally bound by the sun. When it came through, it, it uh, approached the sun to within about like one quarter of the distance of the Earth from the sun. And when it passed uh, the sun, it was moving at about 90 kilometers per second. Right? That's about the, you know, it takes about a little more than three seconds at that speed to go from Luxembourg to Paris. Right, so it's moving very, very fast. Yeah, we so, go about, by the way, we go about one third that speed around the sun, so just to make that relative good, yeah, to that, people. Yeah, that, that's a good yeah, point. About three times as fast as the Earth would yeah. be going around. So, uh, of course, at the, when we found that object is now known as Oumuamua. It's a Hawaiian word that uh, basically means a messenger or a scout from the distant past come to visit us. And uh, there was a lot of telescopes all around the world that 
targeted that object, and uh, we we're very interested for the first time ever to study an object that came from a different source system. So I'm really looking forward to the LSST finding perhaps one of these objects per year in the next decade or two. Yeah, that's a good introduction. Um, uh, the, the characteristics of pan stars and LSST are uh, it, it's, it's sort of uh, A and capital A in a, in a way. Uh, I mean, you, you have a very high cadence or fast cadence. That is, you scan a lot of the sky very fast compared with other telescopes. And for finding asteroids, that's obviously uh, very important. LSST doesn't do it quite as fast, but they can go much deeper. They can see much further than pan stars. Uh, so, Lynn, give us an idea of what, how fast, how much, what kind of a flood of information are we looking forward to from you guys? Right. Um, well, it's, so when LSST starts, we will discover on the order of 10 times more near-Earth asteroids than are being found today. So it's about 3,000 per month. Um, so, so it'll be it'll be dramatic, and it, you know, over time it will slowly taper down a little bit as we as we see objects that we've already right. found. Um, but we'll still be finding more and more all the way through to the end of the survey. So, so it is a significant challenge of of how many objects we'll find, and so also sorting out which objects are really interesting from from this large number of objects. So, one some things that might make them interesting is are they potentially hazardous? Um, are they interstellar objects? Um, do they have some unusual physical characteristics? So one of the things I'm interested in there is how do we look for, for these outliers and these unusual objects? And that is definitely a question of visualization. Um, how do you so just look at all of the information that you have and dig out the interesting things? It's also a question for machine learning. You know, with all that data coming in, um, flooding in, really, it's going to be such a tremendous data rate coming out of LSST. Are, are you guys developing AI systems or something of this kind to identify, hey, this, this hunk of data happens to be really, this is something different, this is unique, or... Yeah, so, caption, so, so as far as, as, as identifying really interesting and unusual objects in the data stream, that's actually outside the well, scope of what the LSST project itself is funded to do, unfortunately. Is it inside somebody else's it scope? Is inside, <laughs> it is inside the science community's scope. Um, so it's just one of these unfortunate boundaries of, of funding, right? The, the, the LSST project, uh, like construction project, is funded to build the telescope. The operations project is funded to operate the telescope. And we provide the data to the community and to the public, and then the public um, and, and the community sort of have the responsibility to, to go in and build that stuff. Now, that said, it's not a wall. Um, we are working closely with the science community in right. particular and the science collaborations to talk about, like, okay, here's, here's what we're going to be providing. And we're, because we are scientists as well, we also are using some of our time to be working on these challenges. Um, so, for example, the LSST Solar System Science Collaboration, which I'm also a member of, um, we're thinking about this now and how do we take this stream of information from LSST and pull out the in interesting things? How do we identify active objects? How do we identify objects that have really unusual light curves? Um, and how do we scale that up for the large amount of data with LSST? Um, that's certainly a big question and I think we're, we're starting to tackle it now and, and um, the Operations start for LSST is coming soon, 2022. So we have a lot of work to do before then. Right, and I hope we're ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I will pass on here now to um, to Mark Basla and. One of the things, Mark and I worked together in the planetary defense area for a long time. One of the uh, annual events which is extremely important is bringing all of the people working in this area together in a planetary defense conference. Mark in particular has been um, a major part in some of the uh, desktop exercises where we simulate a, a, an actual impact coming and and we try to realistically play different roles and respond the way the world 
either will or hopefully will respond. What have we, what have we learned out of this, uh, uh, Mark? And can you describe to, to people a bit of the value of sure. those exercises? Yeah, this is this is actually one of the most interesting, interesting and exciting things I get to do. Um, we have this this meeting every two years. The last one was in uh, the Washington D.C. area, University of Maryland, but it's an international conference and it's been held in Europe. It was held in Japan two years ago, and for the last four conferences, we've held, we've performed these tabletop exercises. And as with any complex activity. You need to practice. You can't just come up with a playbook and never practice. And and so we try to come up with these scenarios, and 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 that scenario team is led by Paul Chodas of uh, Jet Propulsion yeah. Lab, and he's very gifted at coming up with very convoluted yeah. uh, pathological scenarios. <laughs> and they're not necessarily realistic or highly probable, um, but we try to make sure that they are physically accurate, the, the physics of what happens, the, the uh, risk corridor, which is the locus, as you know, of all the points of possible impact if something is going to hit the earth, and then the physics of what happens when it enters the atmosphere, either explodes before it hits the ground or hits the ground and, and creates a crater. All that we try to make as realistic as possible. But the reason it, it's kind of pathological is because we have to have a lot of failure so that we can exercise every component, all the groups of people who are interested in this, from risk assessment and modeling to mission planning, mission design, execution to emergency management. And if you, if you didn't have something go wrong, the emergency managers wouldn't have a lot uh, to do or, or to talk about. So in this most recent scenario, since we had it, uh, since we held the meeting in the United States, it was, it was a US disaster. And this, this risk corridor crossed the entire, actually it started in, in Hawaii and, and went across the entire uh, US and off into the Atlantic. We didn't know which point of those it was gonna hit. It until, in our scenario, very accurate tracking data became available, and then the uncertainty collapsed onto the city of Denver. Um, very unlikely scenario, but it, Denver was like the bullseye for a 200 meter diameter asteroid. So I got to model an asteroid coming through the atmosphere and plowing into my hometown. Um, but in the scenario, it was, a contact binary. It was a big asteroid with a small asteroid sitting on it, but not um, only bound by gravity, so very weakly bound. And we chose to do a, a deflection, which was a partial success, but a partial failure. And the failure was that the little part um, was not fully deflected. So it it continued on its merry way, except it got a very small delta V. It, it was given some momentum, and it, during the deflection, we didn't know where it was gonna go until it got close enough again to be observable, and it happened to be making a beeline for New York City. Um, but it was much smaller, 60 meter in diameter, and so I got to model a, a very large airburst, Tunguska-like airburst, actually bigger than Tunguska, over New York City. So that was the, the end result, but fortunately, it was just an exercise. Yeah, these simulations are, are very important for a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, in the Apollo days, um, it was, we did hundreds and hundreds of simulations, a launch simulation. It, it gets boring if everything works right. I mean, and if, if, if everything works right, you don't have anything to do, basically. You're, you just do the normal things. But of course, the people out on the control panel make everything fail so that if you can survive with half of the things in the spacecraft going wrong instead of right, uh, you, you can probably uh, do it when the real thing comes. And obviously, what we're trying to do here is test the decision makers of various kinds and the scientists, the politicians, and everyone else uh, for things not going right. Um, and hopefully then, when the real thing happens, you know, they, they can handle it. And, and, and we're always trying to throw curveballs, just like right. you experienced when you were training to fly the lunar module. It's the, the same thing. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the key things, uh, and I want to in introduce uh, Christian Corbelli from uh, the University of Vienna and the Vienna Museum. Uh, Christian, you, you're 
kind of an expert. You've studied for a long while the actual impact uh, effects, craters and that sort of thing when they happen. Um, tell us a little bit about what we do and what we don't know about uh, craters both on Earth and, and, and elsewhere. Well, in, in fact, I can even add on to Mark here because uh, the next Planetary Defense Conference 2021 will be in Vienna. So uh, you can destroy Vienna then you know, or something like that. You have a clue as to where the target's going to be. But what I have been doing for a long time uh, is to see the effects. You know, what, if we fail, what happens? You know, uh, And we only need to look in the geological record to see hundreds of impact craters. There's 200 on Earth that we currently know um, that uh, resulted from asteroid impact. And um, even for the small ones, a small impact, uh, a body the size of, uh, of, of a large house, something like that, a 50 meter diameter uh, iron meteorite, for example, could destroy something, a city the size of, of Luxembourg or Frankfurt of Vienna of Rome or something like that. Uh, totally, and we know there; those are only the smallest impact craters that we have on Earth. So we have seen from the geological point of view many, many impacts in the past. Um, and I think there's a variety of important aspects. We're talking about emerging science, yeah? And I think two or three of the things that are emerging right now is that our tools to detect impact craters on Earth get better and better. It's very easy to look on the moon. Everything that you see up there basically is an impact crater, but they're all fairly old on Earth, of course, with the active hydrosphere and atmosphere and, and uh, plate tectonics and everything. Uh, impact craters disappear relatively rapidly, so we need almost forensic tools to discover uh, a very deeply eroded impact crater. Or, for example, the one that we know is related to the extinction of the dinosaurs hasn't been found for a long time because it was covered up by younger rocks. You know? So there's a kilometer of rocks on top hiding it from, uh, from what we see. So we get better and better at detecting impact craters on Earth. And what we find is that in the past of the Earth, there have been some very, very large impacts. If we go back to over three billion years ago, where the rock record on Earth becomes very sparse, we have found some traces, not the craters themselves, but the traces of the impact in form of impact ejecta of very large impacts, larger mm. than any of the ones that we actually have craters of in the last two billion years. So this is interesting because that helps us understand how the early Earth, how the formation of the Earth, how probably uh, the origin of life interacted with, with impacts. Impacts might have had positive influence on the formation of life, might have had negative effects. Uh, positive effects might have been that in a cool early Earth, for example, there might have been uh, warm ponds that are uh, post-impact hydrothermal activity uh, where life might have had some, some places where it could hide for a while or where some organic molecules could develop. So that's one thing. The other thing that we're learning is with geochemical tools, and this is some of the work that I do as well, is that we, we can detect what the composition of the impacting body was. So hmm. what type of asteroid was it that hit the Earth? And again, there we see some differences uh, in the past. So geological means help us to look back in time how the impact population changed with time. And of course, that might help us also understand what happens in the future. So. I think there is a very interesting intersection between the astronomical observation that help us to understand how many bodies are out there. We now know the orbits of almost a million asteroids in the asteroid belt, and there's going to be more and more and more coming. We look back in time through geology. It tells us how many impacts have been there on Earth. It tells us also what the population, what the composition of the impactors was. And the impact modeling of the sort that Mark is doing helps us understand how that thing works. So I think we've been making a lot of interesting progress, and I would say this is really, really top-notch science that, that we're looking at here, and it's of enormous societal relevance. Here, we just have one uh, a very short time left, and uh, I want to get just touch on a, a key issue, and Patrick Michel is perfect gentleman to do it because he's such a perfect communicator with the public. 
Um, but between Patrick and the public are the media in general. And one of the challenges that you, Patrick, and all of us have in communicating to the public is the issue of risk and uncertainty and probabilities. This is a really tough issue. I don't want a full uh, university explanation, but if you can just uh, state the kind of challenge that you've seen in communicating this risk issue to the public. Well, that's a, <laughs> a question that can I have a quick answer. Uh, this is a problem, the risk perception. I avoid statistics with the public because they don't get it. Uh, if you say you have one over one million chance to die from an asteroid impact or whatever, what does it mean from them? I, I'm not sure they know that. So uh, I try to avoid actually this topic with the media, <laughs> with the public. Uh, I just say for the asteroid impact that this is a low, the least likely uh, risk that we have to face on a human lifetime compared to other natural disasters. But this is the only one that uh, we have the ability to predict and prevent by means which are reasonable and feasible. But what I want to say, because we are talking about the emer emergence of new science with asteroids, is that we have now the era of sample return missions. So we'll return samples from asteroids, primitive asteroids in 2020 and 2023. First time we'll be able to analyze in the lab these kind of samples from a primitive asteroid. Then we'll have a, a Phobos sample returned by JAXA. So we'll return the samples of the moon of, um, of Mars, one of the moons of Mars. And we don't know whether it's a captured asteroid or whether it's a giant impact. And then we'll go to visit a metallic asteroid. Uh, and then we'll go to visit Trojan asteroids, which are the one that share the orbit of Jupiter. So it's really, uh, it's not the golden era, it's even platinum era. And by the way, gold and platinum come from asteroid impacts. So so there are many reasons why we need to study. And the risk for me is uh, important because it's the only one we can deal with and it can have big consequences. But I talk about it avoiding probabilities and statistics because each time I make a, a big risk. To, to okay, so. we'll, we, will, we will save, uh, thank you for all, all the contributions, we'll save the issue of communicating risk to the public and probabilities and that kind of thing for the next asteroid day. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Joining me today is Warwick Kramer, CEO of Tomorrow Street, a joint collaboration between Vodafone and the Luxembourgish government. Hi, Warwick. Hi, Solomon. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Lovely. So, Warwick, in terms of the innovation uh, program that you've implemented uh, in Tomorrow Street, what do you think are the or what do you see are the benefits for corporate organizations? Uh, Solomon, I think for innovation, really, I think it's really become a forefront of a lot of organizations thinking. I think many organizations around the world have realized that they need to have some sort of innovation program as part of their organization. Mm -hmm. And really, innovations, it, it really has to be embedded in an organization as part of their DNA and, and their culture, really, to drive those sort of changes. Um, you know, if I think about what we did with the Asteroid Day team, just sitting in, in Tomorrow Street in Luxembourg, that has been absolutely fantastic for us. Yeah. I have to personally admit that I really did not know uh, too much about asteroids, um, you know, before the team sort of joined. But it really got me thinking on a totally different uh, sort of uh, playing field yeah. in terms of even um, – around uh, low orbit satellites, which I really did not know much about and, and what impact that will have in the future and the technology around that. So I think if we think around uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, um, and even just analytics as a whole, what impact that will have on organizations and society and humanity in the future. So I don't think, you know, if you really look at innovation, uh, organizations cannot ex escape it. And the ones that have tried to escape it, um, you know, there's plenty of examples like Kodak, Blockbuster and other organizations that really fail to, to um, drive in, uh, innovation in their organizations. So I think really, uh, ideally, it is very, very important. And I think a lot of organizations, uh, you know, it cannot be a token. It, it has to really, they have to drive it forward in order to survive for the future. Oh, man. Thank you so much, Warwick. That's some great insights. And uh, let's hope that those corporate organizations really, really take take stock of this, this insight and drive forward to the future. Thank you.
Over back to you in the studio. So today we've been hearing a lot about exciting and thrilling technological innovations in space and also ventures into space. And here's another one for you, 3D printing in space. I'm here with JJ, who is operational manager at the company Made in Space. So JJ, give me an elevator pitch about what is Made in Space. Mm, our belief and mission, uh, I will start, start from here, is like we want really people colonizing space. So at the beginning, we were thinking why people should go to space, and we were figured out that they need to do something there. They need to work in space. And they will have a disability when there will be some infrastructure. And um, to make it happen, actually, you need to build this in infrastructure. And at the same time, launching cost is a killer to, to make it happen. So we need simply to do this, to build this in space. So uh, when the 3D printing technology was growing terrestrially, we, we built first 3D printer that, uh, that was operating in space on board International Space Station. This is like from, from where companies mostly known. Mm -hmm. And um, right now our like, next step and flagship program is uh, building a spacecraft called Arcanaut, uh, which simply will 3D print object in space and, um, and then, you know, using robotic system, assembly them to, to build really big structures in space like uh, solar farms. Uh, structures that you will not be able to send to launch during uh, single flight. And um, what, what we are doing here in Luxembourg during, you know, building the Arcanaut spacecraft, we found out that um, robotic system we are looking for must, we must be very advanced. Um, and in the same time, we were looking for opportunity to set up a new business here in Luxembourg. So it was great synergy to come to Luxembourg to set up a subsidiary made in space Europe here in Luxembourg that will develop and produce space arms for very broad uh, space applications, including Arcanaut itself. And, and looking at the robotic arms, I mean, so, so this is one mission. What, what else can sort of you connect this technology into? What are the missions? Mm. Especially in new, in new space, we see that there are more and more ambitious uh, business cases, mission goals, mm -hmm. um, and the more complex mission will uh, will happen in the future, uh, the more robotic system you will need to simply operate uh, this these operations. So we we see that very great market, very exciting market is actually we call it lunar industry. So a lot of these companies that are planning to send a cargo to the on the uh, moon surface uh, and then to build things on board, they they, they probably will be looking for robotic arms. And uh, so this is moon. And here closer to Earth on Earth orbit are all of these companies that are applying satellite servicing, also uh, manufacturing in space, also um, building their own private space stations where robotic arms will be simply needed to capture spacecraft that are coming with tourists. So there is a pretty uh, broad you know, market here, and we're happy that it will be growing up to the moment then these arms will be used also for um, asteroid mining at mm. some point in, in the future. Mm. And the aeronautics, I mean, that's a really interesting concept, and that's what you, you the company is doing in, in the States. Could you just tell us a bit, what is aeronautics? Yeah, so, so uh, Arkinaut is a, is a spacecraft that would have, um, it's flying in few years, three years from now probably. Mm, it will have a 3D printer on board mm. uh, itself, uh, and a few robotic manipulators. Mm. So um, the, the first demonstration mission will simply use 3D printer to uh, print some parts uh, and then use robotic arms to assemble a structure. Uh, so, so you would have an um, object that never, could never be launched on a single flight, uh, like very big antennas for telecommunication sectors, uh, solar panels for objects or payloads that are looking for a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope that in the future we will find a business case for, for Arkinaut where multiple of Arkinauts uh, will be needed you know, to build 
more and more advanced objects, hopefully space cities one day. Well, it's definitely a mission, and um, with all the infrastructure that Arkinaut has, I'm sure that you'll get there. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you very much. Asteroid Day Live shares with us the personal stories and knowledge of asteroid experts, scientists, astrophysicists, business leaders, and even artists, teaching us that to truly understand the origins of our solar system, we have to study it from various perspectives. Asteroid Day Live is the only programming dedicated to introducing you to many of the most prominent asteroid experts in the world. We learn by listening to them share their personal experiences and knowledge of how our solar system was formed, how it is evolving, and how we can protect our beautiful blue planet. But this programming wouldn't be possible without the generous support of major sponsors, including the government of Luxembourg and you. You play a critical role in our ability to shine a bright spotlight on the leading work of astronomers, engineers, scientists, space mission operators, and astronauts, our global rock stars, who bring the topic of asteroids closer to people of all ages and remind our government leaders of the importance of funding planetary science. Asteroids play an important role in our lives, from the formation of our solar system to their extraordinary value for future resource utilization to enabling ongoing exploration of our solar system, and finally, when they impact our home planet. Asteroid Day is more than just a broadcast program. It's thousands of independently organized events in 192 countries. These events are the heart and soul of Asteroid Day, as they connect and engage students on the subject of asteroids. For many students across the world, Asteroid Day is their only opportunity to listen to, learn from, and to meet astronomers, astrophysicists, and astronauts, heroes of the STEM generation. Your support enables the growth of our network of independent event organizers so more events can take place. It allows us to not only encourage the future generation of scientists, but to grow our online library of educational tools enabling more people to dig deeper into asteroids and to connect to scientists, observers, and astronauts. Your support enables us to meet the goals of the United Nations Office for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Affairs by generating awareness of what we can do to protect our planet. Please consider becoming part of this movement by donating to Asteroid Day today.